Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're doing part 119 of our Planet Zoo Mod Spotlights. We'll be taking a look at some of the wonderful mods people have been making and using them to talk about some of the wonderful biodiversity that we share our world with. So today we've got a very interesting assortment of animals. We've got uh, quite a lot of mammals today, but we've got some extinct ones, we've got a marine one, we've got a couple of marsupials, and I know you guys always enjoy those. So let's stop wasting time and get straight into it. So we're going to be starting off today. We've got a mod by Leaf. Uh, this is one of the mini agoutis, the crested agoutis, so a new one coming in. So the crested agouti is from Suriname and uh, I believe French Guiana or something like that. But they're typically lumped into the same species as the red rump agouti because the taxonomy of agoutis is quite interesting. But normally they're considered red rump agoutis uh, and that's why they're considered data deficient. But we're going to just go over the uh, red rump agouti kind of to talk about these guys. But these guys are, uh, as I mentioned, also known as like the Brazilian agouti. Is, these guys are the crested agouti. They get their name because of that black crest on their back that you can kind of see going on there. Let's have a look at you then. So these guys... A kind of native uh, in generally all across like South America they can be found from Venezuela down into the Caribbean also northeastern Brazil and they've been introduced into like Dominica, Granada, things like that but the Crested Agouti as I mentioned is just native to that one place. Um, in terms of the habitat these guys are mostly found in rainforests and secondary forests uh, including a wide range of forests which is really good. Um, these guys also weigh about three to six kilograms or about 6.6 .6 to 13 pounds and they're about 19 to 25 inches or 48 to 64 centimeters long with females being slightly larger than the males but you can see that coat there is definitely dark black with the little crest there that where they get their name from a little bit of like a mane going on <laughs> Typically, there is no distinct breeding season for these guys, but females have been known to come into season about twice a year, and they generally have one to four babies. The gestation period for these babies is about 104 to 120 days. On average, it takes about 20 weeks for the young to be weaned, and they live in family groups and pairs with babies, and they need large areas for their territory, of course, and they are quite difficult to keep in their captivity because of this, because they need large space and for territory, things like that, to search for food, but they can live up to 15 to 20 years of captivity. And in terms of their diet, these guys typically feed on seeds, pulps, leaves, roots, and fruits. And they've also been known to feed on insect larvae when uh, plant resources are low. And they've been known for spreading and dispersing different species of like, tree seeds because agoutis being large and being able to break through hard seeds is actually quite an important uh, evolution. Um, they really help to uh, disperse seeds in their rainforest ecosystems. So they're quite important to the ecology of the rainforest. So really, really cool animal to talk about. But yeah, definitely a big fan of these guys. Lovely, lovely little dude. So uh, that was done by Leaf. Next one's also done by Leaf. We have got the fringe-eared oryx. So uh, these are uh, known as oryx calotus or oryx basia calotus. Uh, or Calotus, you say that. These are either a subspecies or species of oryx, depending on who you ask, native to East Africa. So to get into the taxonomy of that, they were originally described as their own species in 1892 by Osfield Thomas, but then were considered a subspecies of the East African oryx uh, in 1912. But then recently there has been some species concepts and things like that that have kind of brought them as their own species. So it's controversial, but it is like, you know, taxonomy being taxonomy, I guess. But these guys, you can see, they're quite similar to other oryxes. They're relatively strong and muscular antelopes with short slender legs. They typically reach about 153 to 170 centimeters or 60 to 67 inches and head to body length with a tail that's about 45 to 50 centimeters or 18 to 20 inches. And they stand about 110 to 120 centimeters tall or 43 to 47 inches at the shoulder. With males, they're generally slightly heavier, weighing between 167 and 209 kilograms or 368 to 461 pounds. With females being a little bit lighter at about 116 to 188 kilograms or 256 to 414 pounds and for the females but other than that typically the size are quite hard to distinguish from each other you can see they've got a little bit of variation within their uh, hair they're usually going to be like a blondish or like tawny color and or like darker as well but you can see they've also got white across their face and the striped black stripes on their face as well and also on their legs as well and a dark tail as well and a little bit of a white mark along the underbelly there what we mean dark mark as you can see there and um, in terms of their horns, their horns can get between 76 and 81 centimeters, or about 30 to 32 centim uh, inches long. And they're almost straight with only that slight curve going on. And unlike most other antelopes of their type, but like to other oryxes, they're a parallel to the other surface of the uh, animal snout. 
and they are quite similar to males and females and they typically have 16 rings going along there until they like smooth out at the tapering to the point at the top there so in terms of their distribution and habitat these guys are typically found around uh southeastern kenya and northeastern tanzania though previously they've not been found within the serengeti national park there have been herds appearing in there since the 70s and where, where they still remain and they have been um basically in like to inhabit woodlands grasslands and acacia acacia woodlands scrublands and semi-arid grasslands where they typically found and they like to have places with average rainfall of 40 to 80 centimeters or 16 to 31 inches per year and predictions uh, by the IUCN may actually suggest that the population will become restricted to national parks and things because of poaching and uh, habitat destruction due to agriculture around some of these areas. So in terms of their diet and behavior, um, oryxes, about 80% of their diet consists of grasses. And during the wet season, they'll feed on like dayflowers and things, but they'll also eat tubers and things like that and succulent plants that will provide them with water. And um, to help with uh, keeping hydrated, these guys will also uh, have highly concentrated urine and will reabsorb a lot of water in th through their kidneys to kind of uh, preserve water. In terms of herding, these guys will live in nomadic herds, typically about 30 to 40 individuals, with herd ranges being between 300 and 400 kilometers squared, or 120 to 150 miles squared, where the animals will move and search for vegetation. Most adult members of a herd are female, but there are males that are mainly responsible for directing that movement. And when moving in signal file, dominant males will bring up the rear or speed up and slow down the females in front of them, as well as blocking any that try to move away. And within the herd, they typically have a very strict dominance pattern. So they have a very clear one and they'll challenge each other by like fencing each other and uh, moving their heads and even active fights. They'll clash with their horns, but they don't really like stab each other with it. They didn't require and gore each other. So they try to keep it as civil as possible just to make sure they could like uh, maintain their dominance. And predators of these guys include animals such as lions, cheetahs, and leopards. And they've been reported using waterholes at the day to avoid these guys, so they're a bit easier. And they typically will graze uh, early in the morning or the evening and resting or ruminating during the heat of the day and then graze intermittently during the night. They also spend a lot of time grooming themselves compared to a lot of other um, antelopes. Uh, so they actually will suffer less from infections from ticks compared to animals like wildebeest that don't groom themselves, which is really, really cool. And let's have a look at the cute little baby here. Let's have a look at you. We're going to talk about reproduction. So they typically breed throughout the year. And although young are more commonly born in the dry season uh, than other times, uh, males may form territories and attempt to control the females as well and prevent other males from mating. And then they kind of do that. And it's only limiting because there's other males that may have chances because they can't defend such a big territory. And a single young is typically born after a gestation of nine months, same as the person. And they would be between nine to 10 kilograms or 20 to 22 pounds at birth. Uh, the mother will move away from the herd just before giving birth and keep her infant hidden for about three weeks before rejoining the herd soon after. And then they will begin to breed almost immediately, but they typically give birth like every 11 months is typically ideal, with young reaching sexual maturity between 18 and 24 months. And frigid aurochs typically live up to 22 years of captivity. So very interesting animal. Let's see if we find the male. Oh, the male's probably live over there. There's the male here. So he's having a sleep. Look at this wonderful guy. Definitely a very cool animal. And Leaf did a wonderful job bringing it to life. So next up, we have got uh, a new model on the scene. We've got Lorby, who's done a couple of wallabies, and we'll go through that. So we've got here, we've got the Palmer Wallaby. So the Palmer Wallaby is a small hopping kangaroo-like uh, marsupial uh, native to the forests of southeastern Australia. And we're going to talk about a little bit of the discovery and things, so it's really, really cool to talk about that. So in terms of their taxonomy, these guys are um, described in 1840 by John Gold. And um, the original word was supposed to be from the New South Wales Aboriginal language, but we don't actually know the word, what it means. So it's quite interesting. And um, they were actually like almost thought extinct for a while. So we, they were very shy cryptic creatures, so they were never really often seen. So they're thought to be extinct. And even like pretend the end of the 19th century, they were thought to be extinct. But in 1965, workers on Kawa Island in New Zealand, uh, not too far from where I live, near Auckland, um, they tried to control the plague of introduced tamar wallabies onto Kawa Island, which is a quite a carbon species in Australia. But they were staying to just uh, found like a lot of these were actually uh, Tamu wallabies. But they miraculously like um, 
but a miraculously surviving population of Tama wallabies. So some of them weren't Tama wallabies, some were Palmer wallabies, and they were thought long extinct. And there was like an, uh, an effort to exterminate them was put on hold to capture them and send them to Australia and hope that they could breed and repopulate in the wild. But then this renewed interest in, wall in these Palmer wallabies led to another milestone with only a couple of years later in 1967, they found that they were still ex uh, existed in the forest near Gosford in New South Wales. And um, they found alive and well, and then they've been spotted as far as the Queensland's border, and they actually shows that, oh, they're actually not extinct. They're just really well at hiding themselves. So um, that's really, really cool. So in terms of their size, they're actually the smallest member of the genus uh, Notomacropus, so the smallest of the wallabies. They get between 3.2 and 5.8 kilograms, which is about 7 to 12 pounds. It's just less than one-tenth the size of a red kangaroo, which is the largest member. They get to about a meter or half a meter or 1.6 feet long, and they have a sparsely furred blackish tail about the same length as themselves. Uh, their fur, as you can see, is reddish to grayish brown, with it being graying on the head and becoming pale on their stomach. Um, presumably, individuals have been sighted many times of the year with the extinct, but they were thought to be other things like paddy melons, uh, which is another really interesting thing about these guys. So in terms of their habitats, these guys tend to live in hard-leaved forests in northeastern South Wales. Uh, like the paddy melon, they like forests with thick undergrowth or grassy patches. Uh, they will come out occasionally. And they'll even be can be found in rainforests and dry eucalyptus forests sometimes. They are mainly nocturnal and will use shelters and thick scrub during the day, though they can travel at speed as run away if necessary. They typically emerge shortly, be uh, shortly before dusk to feed on grasses and like and herbs in the forest clearings. And while they're largely solitary, they will sometimes group together in groups of like two or three, and sometimes will come together to feed in favorable circumstances. Let's have a look at the cute little baby here. Oh, that's elderly. Let's see if we can find a baby. It's a juvenile. We'll have a look at the baby here. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, they were thought extinct for old, and, that, and that's because they're quite rarely seen. And the status is also a kind of encouraged that as well. So the species remains really seen, so not seen too often in the wild. But there is evidence to suggest that could be a population decline, so they are considered near threatened by the IUCN. But yeah, really, really interesting uh, to see about the population, stuff like that. Very interesting conservation story, another one of those lost species found again. So really, really cool. So that's the Palmer wallaby, and now we're going to be have a look at Lorby made another wallaby, one of its very close relatives. We have got the Tama wallaby. So really, really cool here. Also known as the Drama wallaby. So let's have a look. So. The drama wallaby, these guys are a small wallaby native to south and western Australia. And their range is thought to greatly um, reduce since colonization of the, with the Europeans, but they're now considered to be, uh, less concerned. So we'll talk about a little bit uh, about them as well. So as I mentioned, they are uh, were described in 1628. Uh, pretty much they were first seen and described in 1817. Um, these guys are originally called Macropus, but now they're in their own genus, the wallabies Notomacropus. And fossil evidence suggests that these guys existed in the Narracourt Caves and kind of they split the mainland and island dwelling populations of um, Tama wallabies that lived on like Kangaroo Island and some other small islands. They split about 7,000 to 15,000 years ago, with South and Western Australian populations kind of diverging about 50,000 years ago. So they're still uh, isolated, but they obviously were, they're still the same species, it's just different populations isolated by time. And there seems to be three different groups. There's typically like uh, the main population with some island populations, one group, and then the second group with Finders Island and and mainland australia and new zealand and then the third group from the population of kangaroo island which is pretty cool so uh, in terms of their classification and kind of adaptations uh, these are one of the smaller wallaby species just a little bit bigger than the palmer wallaby uh, the tamil wallaby has a small head with large ears also with an elongated tail with a thick base you can see they got dark gray and underparts and they have the pale underside and rufous color on the like, side and chest there they typically ex uh, exhibit pretty big sexual dimorphism, with males reaching about 9 kilos, about 20 pounds, while females weigh about 6.9 kilos, or about 15 pounds. Males are typically 59 to 68 centimeters, or 23 to 22 inches long, uh, while females about 52 to 63 centimeters, or 20 to 25 inches long, with both sexes standing about 45 centimeters tall. And they have a tail length of about 35, 34 to 45 centimeters, or 38 inches for males, a little bit smaller, 33 to 44, or 13 to 17 inches for females. Which is quite interesting. So very much like other species of um, uh, wallabies and kangaroos, 
they have adapted this really interesting way of hopping around. So it's a really efficient way because they are able to collect a lot of energy that they use in the tendons. So it's very efficient to kind of hop around like that because the uh, tendons pretty much just act as a spring and they hold a lot of their energy. So it's very energy efficient to move around like that. And it's a really cool adaptation they had. There's not many other animals develop that adaptation. So it's a really cool thing about these guys. In terms of their sensors, these guys uh, have pretty good peripheral vision. So they can see nearly like 360 degrees and have 50 degrees binocular vision. So And they actually seem to have light vision that's better than most other small mammals. And its vision is nevertheless as good as that of a cat or a person. So that's pretty good. And they seem to have color vision and can be sensitive to the blue-green band on the color spectrum as well. And the pinnae on their ears are mobile, so they can move their ears around and use it to pinpoint sounds. So they're quite good at hearing as well. And in terms of controlling their body temperatures, they will lick their forearms or pant to try and keep cool. And um, they will breathe heavily and they cannot really live uh, when temperatures are above 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, to prevent dehydration as well, they will, you, they will pee less and then they'll also have uh, absorb more water in their colon, which means they have dry feces. And because of their kidneys, because they can concentrate more urine, they can actually uh, survive on seawater, which is really, really interesting. So in terms of their life's history, as we mentioned, these guys like to stay close to shrub and shade and they have home ranges between 16 uh, acres to 40 acres. But in the dry summers, these guys kind of range further afield to find quality food up to about 100 acres or 42 hectares. And they'll share these with other uh, conspecifics, other wallabies and other animals as well. But they've been known to both graze and browse. So these guys will kind of do both and just go eat the leaves and plants, things like that. They'll also gather in groups where there's less of a chance of individual being taken by a predator. And as these group increases, they'll spend more time grooming and uh, interacting and less time being vigilant and moving around. Uh, they also uh, like to rest on their sides in more alert position uh, than they would normally. Let's have a look at the little baby while we get a chance. And um, predators of these guys can include animals such as dingoes, feral cats and red foxes. Both cats and foxes are introduced species. And wedge-tailed eagles. And they would most, most likely would have been preyed upon by the thylacine until they went extinct, of course. Uh, Tambor wallabies also respond more to the sight and the sound of predators. And they can actually have a pretty accurate sense of smell and use to detect them. And when they were are detected, they create a thumping sound with their foot like a rabbit. And they also can emit a distress call. Um, it's like a uh, adult females actually have been known to use these calls as well. So they have a pretty strong distress call. In terms of their development, these guys are quite promiscuous. So they're basically, they are, and they are seasonal breeders. So they'll typically breed between late January to early February. And during this breeding season these guys are going to get ready for that the females and estrus and the male will kind of like fight with other males and uh try and make guard the female to make sure he gets a chance with her pretty much and in terms of um giving birth they're actually receptive quite shortly after giving birth and they will actually undergo an embryonic diapause so they're able to pause their baby's development for like a year or so and the joy in the pouch will prevent this for developing the first six months. It actually shows that they can actually, the re uh, removing of a joy within this time period will stimulate the development. So basically they can always be pregnant because they can have basically three babies at the same time. They can have one in the uterus, one in the pouch, and one like outside the pouch. So they're constantly able to kind of repurpose and breed those things like that. And because they are marsupials, and this is something that's really well studied in these guys, uh, they have different types of milk through the different stages of the development because they have a bunch of different teats. They can give babies certain uh, types of milk during its development that allows uh, for the formation of things like the, they have kind of lactation phases, you could say. And for the first few days of like 100 to 120 days before birth, these guys will have diluted milk that has lots of carbohydrates, things like that. Then they'll be given proteins and stuff like that as milk changes as they develop. So really, really interesting uh, um, way of giving the babies the right nutrients and stuff to develop. It's really, really interesting, I think. Really, really cool. And also they actually will use this part to kind of develop because uh, the babies are ectothermic so they need to keep warm. They need the mother to keep them warm but then they develop as they get bigger and bigger they'll become endothermic or have to maintain their own body temperature. And the joeys uh, no longer need to be in the pouch by 250 days and are fully weaned by 300 to 350 days. And the uh, wallaby has also been known to give an allopetric care where they'll adopt the young of another um another wallaby which is really cool and they typically can live uh they mature at about nine months of age and can live to about 14 years or males mature about two years and live to about 11 years which is really really cool so in terms of their conservation these guys are doing pretty well 
So they live around uh, the numerous like kangaroo islands, things like that, but they have a population of a maximum of about 50,000 individuals. But because of that fragmentation, that could lead to uh, inbreeding in some of these populations. But since European populations, their pop- uh, colonization, their populations have greatly declined and sometimes even been eradicated because people saw them as pests and things like that. And they were also introduced to Kawab Island in New Zealand by Sir George Grey in uh, 1870 and in the Rotorua in the early 20th century but they have flourished and stuff like that that's why people do a lot of pest control down there to control the wallabies and they're quite sens- uh, s- uh, sensitive to fluoro- uh, sodium fluorositate which is also known as 1080 uh, which has been used to kill them and um, some populations are more resistant to others than like la- so but luckily the new zealand population is descended from uh, a mainland population or well, kangaroo island population which are less uh, vulnerable to uh, more vulnerable to 1080s kind of works out like that in the end which is quite interesting but yeah really really cool uh in terms of science as well these guys have been used in a model organism for a while as uh they're easy to breed and people have been really studying like their lactation as well uh the immunology metabolism and neurobiology and they've been really great for studying that because they're easy to keep in captivity they've been really used for like uh, comparison genetics their genome has been sequenced as well and their milk has actually been uh shown to potentially be a great antibiotic so they could be developed something in the future and that's really really interesting so really cool animal great to see them uh, have an impact on human science and all that so yeah really really cool so that was again done by lobby as well so next up we're moving back into the ice age uh narwhala has done a remake of our uh of his um stag moose so really really cool so this is Cerveralces scotti also known as the elk moose or stag moose these guys are an extinct species of deer that lived in north america during the last ice age and um they're the only north american member of their genus which is uh, Cerveralces, and their closest living relative is the modern moose or alces alces and um you can see they're quite as large they're about the same size as a modern moose but they have but they're the main difference is their antlers and they have a little bit more of a normal typical deer like muzzle so they don't they typically they have look their face looks much more like that of a typical deer in comparison to uh moose and um also they've got much heavier branching kind of uh antlers that are very very unique to them and these guys got quite big they got about 2.5 meters or about eight feet tall at the shoulder and length and uh, they weighed about 700 uh, kilograms or one and a half uh, thousand pounds pretty much and they lived in north america with lots of other megafauna such as the woolly mammoth uh, types of ground sauce longhorn bison saber-toothed cats scrub ox and things like that and they became extinct with them at the end of the ice age and with the most recent evidence of them actually the most complete skull has been found in Evia, indiana it was dated about thirteen thousand years ago so that was about right close to their extinction so in terms of their paleobiology they are thought to become because there's uh, a species of in the genus away Cervalsus latifrons, which was huge. It was the biggest uh, deer, even bigger than Megaloceros. I believe is nearly like it was like a ton and a half almost. Um, it's believed to descended from this population that got into America during the Middle Pleistocene, and then these guys would have loved living in the kind of these spruce parkland environments with animals such as the woodland muskox, giant beavers like Castoroides. Uh, caribou and the typical range was now from what southern Cal- uh, canada to arkansas into iowa and new jersey and as the glaciers retreated these guys um may have had uh may have populated the habitat so the normal moose may have come and uh basically taken their place and ecosystem and could be competition for these guys which is one of aspects for their extinction as we'll talk about since these guys could have lived in a natural range or narrow geographic range in a specific habitat they would have made them more vulnerable to extinction and there is evidence because the ice age has always been something like everyone talks about how how did the megafauna go extinct there are a lot of aspects uh, that they talk about like obviously people hunting them climate change but it's really a lot more complicated than that, even disease it seems like for the case maybe a species specific example these guys may have been outcompeted by the european moose so they when they came to america they only came to america about fifteen thousand years ago something like that same with elk a lot of quintessential american animals like moose elk uh bison and like grizzly bears and wolves are actually descended from pretty recent invasions from eurasia and they outcompeted or potentially like took the places of animals like the short-faced bear dire wolves uh, stag moose is a great example as well so i think that's another underrated part of their competition and they could have also spread diseases that could have uh 
hurt the native populations of stag moose and things like that because they didn't just have the immunity to them so i think that's a really another important aspect that's not really talked about a lot within the extinction of uh these guys but yeah most things uh most likely the reasons they could have gone extinct was because of habitat change since these guys like moose today these guys would like bogs and things like that that would have changed as the climate got drier there would have been less of that could have uh, put a hurt on their population could have also um been people and disease that could have spread for both people and of course um could have spread from uh uh moose as well so in competition from moose and then their populations could have declined from there and could have been a reason for their extinction but you can see how different they look from moose like they're very similar to a moose but you can see the snout it's very very different but yeah really really cool really love the look at the female and look at this cute little baby how cute and i love the little spots it makes them a little bit different definitely a big fan of this guy I love the changes so yeah really really cool another wonderful extinct mod from narwhaler so next up we have got the west indian manatee so this one is done by leaf jen and buffsu let's see if they're going to go on the water i know there's kind of been some issues with them i wanted to go on water recently let's see if they'll do it oh, yeah. no they're gone okay so let's have a look at you a really wonderful animal so the western indian manatee which is also known as the north american manatee these guys are quite a large aquatic mammal that's found to the caribbean and can be found from the eastern us down to the brazil so uh, in terms of their description, these guys get to about 2.7 to 3.5 meters or about 8 to 11 feet long and can weigh between 200 and 600 kilograms or 440 to 1,320 pounds with females generally being bigger than males. And the largest recorded individual, uh, she was about 165, uh, 165 on oh no, the 1,655 kilograms or about 3,640 uh, 3, nine pounds and weighed about and was about 15 meters long and uh, about 4.6 meters and they're quite long lived animals they've been known to live about 50 years or more in the wild and the oldest one we know snooty lived for about 69 years so she was born in 1984 and sadly died in 2007 so since these guys are mammals they have to breathe air they're warm blood and they produce milk and like other sirenians these guys are quite well adapted to uh, live a life in the water they have quite streamlined bodies and lack external ears as well and that makes reduces drag. Uh, they also ha have uh, kind of vibrissae or hairs that cover their body that are very minor. But that is believed to reduce the buildup of algae, but also allows them to feel things. They also can, their main color is gray, but because they get covered by algae and things, there is quite a bit of variety in what they are um, kind of colors can be like because of course they could be covered in algae but yeah that's really really cool and there is lots of scar tissue these guys can also get covered in barnacles and things like that and scar tissue uh typically comes out as white and you can kind of see quite obvious and they also have three to four nails on each flipper uh, which gives away their ancestry and these guys are a close relative of elephants so these guys are in the group afrothera that includes elephants manatees dugons uh aardvarks uh hyraxes things like that so a lot of really interesting animals in that group so these guys are rel relative to elephants and they liked elephants they actually have a prehensile snout which they use to grab vegetation and bring it in their mouths so typically they can use none of that three parts of them there i don't know why they're hanging out in the water like that but you can see they've got the three parts of them there that they can use the kind of and also vibrissarae or kind of hairs that they can put on their uh, nose to kind of grab things and things like that which is really really cool and also they have six to eight molar form teeth in each quadrant and they kind of come through like a conveyor belt very similar to elephants so they replace them kind of da -da 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 -da. and then they also have uh eat vegetation of up to eight hours a day and they can eat about eight to ten percent of their body weight in a day of plants and they also have i mentioned these hairs that can provide uh information about their uh environment they're also thought to be convergent to the lateral line of like a fish so they're able to detect like temperature and the orientation in the water and things like that which is really really cool another cool thing about these guys is that they're also uh neutrally buoyant and they have solid bones uh so they can act as a ballast and it's also contrasted by their high fat content so it allows them to sink in the water and be easy for them to stay underwater and this makes it much more easier for them and unlike uh compared to other mammals they have a longitudinally orientated diaphragm that's split in half so it allows them to basically control each lung which is really really cool so in terms of their distribution and habitats these guys live let's see if we can get one in the water again these guys typically live 
uh, in mostly shallow coastal areas, including rivers and estuaries. And they are quite tolerant to salinity, so they can live both in fresh water. But they have an extremely low metabolic rate and thick fat allows them uh, limits them to locations in warmer waters, like uh, tropical regions. But they can be found like in some places a little bit cooler waters. So the Florida subspecies that we typically consider, they're typically found around Florida, of course, but they've been spotted as well as like uh, Massachusetts and Gulf of Mexico. And they've also been seen in like uh, Memphis, Tennessee, which is over 700 river miles away from the Gulf of Mexico, which is quite interesting. And the Antillean subspecies typically lives throughout the Caribbean, lives into Mexico and Brazil. But typical like in, in my, uh Mitochondrial DNA shows that these kind of three locations is the Florida and Greater Antilles population, the Mexico, Central American, North Amer uh, Northern South American population, and Northeast and South American population. Though typically their distribution depends a lot on temperature. So if they are in places that are kind of uh, below 20 degrees Celsius, there, there's a great increase of uh, risk and cold stress for the manatees. So they tend to like to find places. They'll even find places that are artificially warm, like power plant runoff, to kind of keep warm and during the winter and things like that. So that's really, really cool. But of course, in some more southern parts of their range, they tend to be less susceptible because it's not as cold down there. So in terms of behavior, because manatees are so big and they don't have uh, natural predators, they just don't have natural predators. And uh, because of their large size and capacity for... Um, uh, low metabolic rates, they can actually do long deep dives as well as have a be quite slow. Uh, they have been, in spite of their docile demeanor, their large size means they have no natural predators. And though they're solitary um, as well, and they do, American crocodiles and stuff may occasionally eat manatees. And there has been a manatee seen with bites from bull sharks and uh, or a tiger shark. But because of their habitat, typically live in quite shallow water, they're not very likely to meet a lot of these species. So, um... Though if you're in more open water, they could be more vulnerable to things like orcas and sharks. But really interesting, they have a great interesting way of communication. So they've been known to form large mating herds when they um, come around near a female. And they give chemical indicators and stuff like that. So they use a lot of chemicals and sounds to communicate. They also communicate with each other with all sorts of different vocalizations. Uh, with like differences between they like, squeak and screech to different animals. And they can also like have a language almost, you could say. And there seems to be like individuality among manatees, so they kind of be like they have their own voice, which is really really cool. And lots of uh, vocalizations mean different things, like some will mean to like a mother to a calf, things like that. So they all have got interesting like uh, variation within those uh, calls to kind of tease each other apart, pretty much. And also they will uh, produce sounds very similar to most other mammals. They have vocal folds, things like that. And they'll also be known to eat manatee other manatee species, which is used to grab uh, information about their reproductive status and their dominance. So they use that kind of chemical uh, uh, way of communicating. It's called um, chemoreception to kind of uh, figure out the reproductive status and the social status of these manatees, which is quite cool. Uh, manatees are also obligate herbivores, so they typically will feed on over 60 species of aquatic plants in both fresh and salt water. Uh, seagrass is a staple of the manatee diet, particularly in coastal areas. And when the tide is high enough, they'll often come onto uh, like they'll uh, bring their feet, uh, hands onto land and kind of graze on that. They'll do that as well, which is really interesting. They will typically graze for about four to five times, uh, five hours a day, and will uh, eat about eight to ten percent of their body weight, as I kind of already mentioned. Let's see if I can get you there. And um, because of the, they feed on abrasive part, their molars get worn down quite quickly. So like elephants, they have that constant conveyor belt of molars to kind of uh, keep up with all their eating. And like elephants, they're also their hindgut fermenters, so they're not ruminants like uh, deer and uh, goats and things like that. These guys have quite a large cecum and large gastrointestinal plaque, uh, tract, which is actually quite efficient. It accounts for about 23% of the body mass. So that large, large intestine will kind of hold a lot of plants that they use to digest and uh, ferment in their bodies to kind of better be able to get all the nutrients out of it, which is quite cool. And the passes of food from their kind of from their mouth to the anus is about seven days. So it does take quite a while to get out of them. And the slow it kind of increases that digestibility of the diet. And that's why they're and also the fermentation within their body produ uh, provides additional heat. So that kind of helps keep them a little bit warmer. So that's quite cool. So in terms of, as I mean, I already mentioned the Vibrissiae and how they could have been uh, analogous to a lateral line and things like that. But we're going to have a look at the cute little babies, even though they shouldn't be on land. 
Uh, in terms of reproduction, uh, manatees uh, typically reach sexual maturity about three to four year, uh, years of age. So the males do. The females about three to five. Uh, they're able to. Ca they're pretty capable of breeding throughout their entire adult life, but they will first breed successfully typically at about seven to nine years of age. Breeding will occur in these mating herds. So these guys will kind of several males will kind of find a female that's an estrus and kind of uh, follow her around and then try to kind of get their way with her. But typically the oldest males and the biggest males kind of have uh, the most success. So typically the biggest and uh, oldest kind of gets the uh, best chance of mating. Uh, the reproductive uh, anatomy of males consists of internal teats within the cap uh, cavity. So it's inside them, which is quite interesting. And females are very similar to elephants and like they have a uh, placenta and things like that. And they have an oval disc around their uh, convex, uh, which is quite cool. And um, typically the gestation period for these guys is about 12 to 14 months. And they give birth to one or maybe really two calves a year. And uh, when the calf is born, they usually weigh about 60 to 70 pounds or 70, 27 to 37 kilograms at about 4 to 4.5 feet long or about uh, 1.2 to 1.4 meters. Manatees do not form permanent bonds uh, and males contribute nothing to the baby's care. So typically they're kind of doing their own thing. I think we'll have a look at these guys over here since we've already covered that. These guys typically do their own thing. Um, like females actually have two mammary glands, so the two teats under their elbows, very similar to elephants in that regard. Unlike a lot of animals that have them on their stomach, that's where the baby feeds from. And the lactation period lasts about one to two years. And prior to weaning, they will have like a huge uh, increase of hormone, the progesterone in their mother. And during the two year period uh, where their calf is with their mother, they learn how to locate warm water and migrate and things like that. So their mother teaches them a lot of things. And then um, a single female can reproduce every two to three years, which is referred to as a calving interval. And wild manatees have been documented breeding into their 30s, uh, late 30s, and female captive manatees have given birth in their late 40s. So they can breed pretty much throughout their lives. Though most people don't like breeding cap manatees in captivity because the conservation concerns uh, can be addressed quite well in their native environment. So there's not really not much of a need to have a breeding, uh, a breeding program. But in terms of their conservation, there are species that's considered vulnerable, but both subspecies considered endangered, both for quite different reasons, as we'll get into. So they are considered, as I mentioned, they've been on the endangered species list since the 1970s, and the full species of both subspecies are kind of considered that because they have the low number of mature individuals, and there's been lots of big declines. Uh, they face different threats, but the the largest case of death for Florida, uh, classes of death for Florida manatees is includes collision with water, watercraft, Loss of war water habitat, high mortality, entanglement and eating like plastics and things like that, pollution, habitat loss, and harmful, uh, harmful algae blooms like red tides. That's the main thing that affects the populations of Florida manatees. Uh, in Antillian manatees, they suffer from pretty bad habitat fragmentation, illegal hunting. In some countries, they can also, uh, tourism has been an issue because they've been colliding with uh, Water, uh, watercraft as well so that's another big thing but they're both really badly impacted from that but luckily there's lots of conservation efforts to try and protect both of them and yeah really cool species that you how can you not love these guys so really really cool how can you not love these manatees again done by leaf Jan and buffsu another cool remaster definitely awesome to see that so last but definitely not least we have got by narwhaler we have got the african shiva there so let's have a look at these wonderful guys over here so there's kind of three species of Shiva there that we'll get into. So Shiva Therium, or Shiva's Beast, which is uh, the Shiva, which is an Indian god, uh, or uh, I think Hindu god, and uh, Therium is Beast, so basically Shiva's Beast. These guys are an extinct genus of giraffids, so they're related to our copies and giraffes, and they range throughout Africa into India, and there's kind of three different species recognized. There's, uh, this species is the African species, we could say, is Shiva Therium... Uh, Mansurum. There's also uh, S. hedoni, which is from the early Pliocene of South Africa. And also there is the largest species, and it's actually one of the largest, if not the largest ruminant of all time, uh, Gigantium, which lived in India. So as I mentioned, these guys typically evolved, these guys evolved around the late Pleis uh, Miocene, so about 7 million years ago in Africa. It lived throughout to the early Pleistocene. 
Uh, and S. gigantium has been recovered around the Halmayan footlands about a million years ago. And there actually just suggestions that this species, the African species, may have lived up to about 8,000 years ago due to rock paintings. Uh, and also some other paintings around the Sahara and Central West Africa. So there's things that resemble them in painting, so it could be them. But we don't have the fossil evidence. We don't have the um, fossil evidence to suggest that. And uh, depictions are likely could be other animals as well. So as you can see, Shivatherium as a giraffe, they look quite a lot like other okapis, uh, like okapis in that regard, but they're actually much uh, heavier built and larger. Uh, these guys typically about 2.2 meters or about 7 feet at the shoulder, and, or about 3 meters or 9.8 feet in total uh, length, and they weigh up to about 400 to 500 kilograms or about 880 to 1100 pounds. But new estimates actually make them a lot bigger, especially the larger species Gigantium. So... Uh, Shivatherium gigantium has been estimated to be about 1,250 kilograms or 2,760 pounds or 1,360 kilograms or about 3,000 pounds. So this would make Shivatherium that one of the largest known, if not the largest known ruminant. So it's the hindgut and not the foregut fermenter. So the animals with four chambered stomachs, such as like uh, uh, bison, horses, not horses, uh, goats, uh, cows, things like that. And that there actually was a recent study to suggest that this is actually pushing the boundaries of how big a ruminant can get. So they would likely be the largest, if and because this is actually considered, uh, because these guys are kind of um, so big, and you compare them to other animals like the bottom giraffe and things like the longhorn bison that get over a ton, but these guys are actually like uh, thought to be an underestimate because of. Uh, they didn't take to account because the individuals in these uh, estimates wasn't the largest individuals known and also because they were not to take into account the ossicones or these large like antler-like projections here. So ossicones and antlers are very different but it's a great example of convergent evolution because these ossicones kind of uh, there's all sorts of different species of giraffids with all sorts of different weird headgear and things like that. There's even one that looks like Pachycephalosaurus but you can see these guys got almost like antlers going on and it's a great example of convergence so uh, they're, they're made very differently. Ossicones are kind of very differently made to antlers, but they kind of all share the same purpose and can be really interesting headgear to use for fighting for females and displays and things like that, which is really, really cool. And because of that, they have these wide antler-like ossicones, and they also have these strong necks to support them as well and neck muscles to lift a quite heavy skull. And a little bit about the taxonomy as well. We'll go over to their diet. There was a dental wear analysis of one species of Shiva there that, that lived in South Africa, the um, head and say, if you say that. It showed they were brachiodont teeth, but they had higher hypsodonty than a giraffe. So these guys were not quite as specialized browsers as modern giraffe. These guys are more mix feeders, so they'd be grazing and things like that. And in terms of their taxonomy, they were actually thought originally to be uh, the ancestral link between uh, ruminants, so obviously I've mentioned like uh, goats, uh, cows, and things like that. They were thought to be what the link between ruminants and things like pachyderms, so elephants, rhinos, horses, and tapirs were all thought to be related. But now we know, and it was thought to be because they're quite robust morphology, but now we know that's not true at all. These guys are a giraffe, a uh, giraffe through and through, a giraffe. -ed. Um, and in terms of taxonomy, the rhinos, horses, and tapirs are now in their own group, the odd-toed ungulates, the perissodactyla, and uh, elephants are not related to them at all. They're all the way in Afrotheria, related to manatees, uh, hyraxes, uh, otter shrews, and elephant shrews, and animals like that, and aardvarks. So that's really interesting to show how much that changes. But yeah, really, really cool. Uh, the mansirium, I believe, if you look at this species, this species is probably about, as you see, average about 950. So they could get quite big, and we kind of mentioned all of that here. Yeah, really, really cool. Uh, Hindu god, yeah, that's right. So yeah, really, really awesome. Nice to see now while they're making some more extinct animals and get a cool chance to talk about them. I really love the design, love the big ossicones and all that. Really, really awesome. Let's have a look at the cute baby while we get the chance. Really, really awesome. So cute little baby giraffe. Uh, giraffe I love the Shiva Thears. And if it's true that they managed to live 8,000 years, who knows, it could be subject of some de-extinction efforts, but we don't have the... Uh, Fossil evidence suggests they lived that early. It's really just paintings and things like that. But really, really cool if that turns out to be true. Maybe we just don't have the fossils yet because we know the fossil record is obviously very patchy. But anyway, I think this is a great place to end the video. So I uh, really, really, really hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified of any things. So yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. And bye-bye.